Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the highlight of your entire existence. It's called Coffee with Scott Adams, and as luck would have it, that's who I am, so no substitute teachers today. You wouldn't want a substitute sipper. It wouldn't be the same, would it? No, it wouldn't. How would you like to take it up a notch? Are you satisfied with where you are in life? No, no, you're not. Let's go. And all you need is a cup or mug or glass, a tanker, Chelsea Stein, a canty, jug or flask, a vessel of any kind. Fill it with your favorite beverage. I like coffee. And join me now for the unparalleled pleasure, the dopamine here of the day, the thing that makes everything better. It's called the simultaneous sip. And it happens now. Go. Ah. Ah. I'm going to start with some advice that will change some of your worlds forever. And when I say that, (laughs) that, that's actually not hyperbole. I'm going to say something right now that for some of you, and this is just a law of numbers, some small number of you, it will completely change your life. You don't have a choice of of being addicted or not. You only have a choice of what you're addicted to. So if you manage your addictions to create an addiction, let's say to fitness, or an addiction to even healthy food, an addiction to um, just doing good things uh, for your lifestyle, taking a walk in nature, maybe you're going to be addicted to a substance. Choose your substances carefully. I'm not going to recommend any particular substance, but... If the thing you decided to use was, let's say, heroin, you probably made a wrong choice. But look to get addicted to something, but choose carefully. Choose carefully. You probably don't have an option of avoiding addiction because the people who addict you are part of the capitalist market system, and they keep getting better and you keep staying the same. You get that, right? (laughs) You're, you stopped evolving. <laughs> You're exactly the same as, at least DNA-wise, you're pretty much the same as when you were born. But the technology for getting you addicted to stuff, such as video games, such as your phone, such as drugs, they're all getting way better. So it's no longer a fair fight. There probably was a time it was a fair fight because you didn't really have access to addicting things. And... You know, if you did, maybe it wasn't that addictive. If you were not, let's say, if you were not genetically inclined toward alcoholism and there wasn't much of it around anyway, well, you're probably safe. But what happens if you grow up in a world in which addiction is the texture of your reality? It's just addictions. We're, we're only addicted now. It's just to choose your addiction. So for some of you, This will be an insight that changes the direction of your life forever. Choose your addiction. Don't imagine that you won't have any. Don't imagine that. Those days are gone. You will be addicted. You can only choose which addictions you get addicted to. And you can hope that those uh, fill up your shelf space and make you happy enough that when somebody offers you some heroin, you say to yourself, you know, I'm happy enough without it and then you don't have to worry about that one. Uh, at the, toward the end of this, I'm going to give you a hypnotist diet plan, which will not require you to be hypnotized, nor will it require you to hypnotize yourself. It's simply something that hypnotists hypnotist know, and other people don't know. <laughs> and it basically is starting with the mental game and working from there. And we'll do that at the end. Normally, I would save that content for what I call a micro-lesson for my subscribers on Locals. But if there's anything I've learned about my subscribers on Locals, that when I do something that has that, let's say, that much potential benefit to people in general, they usually prefer that I unblock it. In other words, that I drop the paywall. So I'm going to drop the paywall on this one. 
Usually I ask first, but I'm sure that I know the answer on this one. This one's too good. So you wouldn't want me to keep this to myself. All right? Wait for that at the end. But first, update on the Mandate Rebellion, as I call it. The Great Clawback, where we're trying to get our freedoms back uh, as quickly as possible. New news from the CDC. Um, You know what CDC stands for? CDC stands for Children Don't Count. Uh, We we save them last, according to the headlines. Um, So here's what... uh, I don't think that the uh, kids have quite understood, or, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the officials have not quite understood. And see if this is different in your town. Uh, and by the way, this is in the context of the CDC saying that the seven-day average of daily new infections is uh, 42% down, almost 43% down from last week. Remember we were hoping that that big Omicron, Omicron uh, spike would be just as sharp on the way down. 43% dis- uh, decrease one week. 43%. <laughs> so remember, all of, us, all of us who were saying, it's time, it's time, it, you know, I'd rather go a little early than waiting too late on this stuff because the mandates are so oppressive. And I feel like, I feel like our timing was pretty good. Pretty good. So, and keep in mind that this is the winter. The winter thing should be sort of at the worst. Not as bad as Christmas, but still winter. And so we should be, you know, just crashing the number of infections. Uh, Hospitalizations are going down. Everything's looking good. And still, kids are wearing masks in school. Now, let me tell you just one of the many reasons this is ridiculous. You know, forget about the fact Kids don't have the same risk profile, all the, the special risks that a kid has when they're developing, etc. You all, you all know those arguments. But here's one I haven't seen yet. And if there are any parents watching this, can you back me up on this? If you're in a kids wear masks in school state, back me up on this. As soon as they walk out of school, they take their masks off. <laughs> and then... They don't usually go home alone, do they? They usually go hang out with friends, the same ones they they were hanging out with without masks. Now, when they're in school, they're separated by their little desks with their masks on. The moment they walk out, they take their masks off and they start hugging, literal, actual hugging, because kids are very huggy these days, the teenagers especially. And they're all over each other. They're wrestling, they're hugging, they're having sleepovers. Am I wrong? Is it different where you are? Kids are literally all over each other, you know, in, in innocent ways, mostly. But, I mean, if you... <laughs> did, did kids stop making out? Did teenagers stop dating? <laughs> there, there's literally, once the kids walk out the door... They're not only not separated by desks, they're literally all over each other. And I mean, this is one of those times when literally comes close to working. <laughs> not exactly, but, but they're all over each other. So if you ever argued that masks made sense, surely you could not imagine it makes sense in a world in which only a little part of your day you wear them and then you're, you're surrounded by the same people plus your family without them. Who would think that that little bit of masking in school is that that's what's making the difference? Oh, it's holding back the dam. I don't believe anybody would think that. I believe that the... Let let me say it in a more clear way, because maybe somebody can take this argument forward. In order to think that masking in school makes sense, you would have to be completely blind to the fact that the kids take them off as soon as they walk out. (laughs) You would have to just ignore that. Like, like uh, no, mm, no, mm, 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 you know, like fingers in your ears. You couldn't possibly, with a straight face, in person, nobody, nobody could stand in front of you in person and say, um, here, here, I'll, try to, I'll try to do it. It makes perfect sense to mask the kids in school despite knowing that on weekends and evenings they're completely unmasked 
and slobbering their spittle all over each other in an unstoppable way, just like always. I, I think that makes perfect sense. Do you think somebody could say that to your face? Now, here's what they could say to your face. They could say infections are high. They could say masks work, you would argue, maybe. But they could say that. They say infections are still high, masks work, schools are a place where you know there's a lot of congregating. So it makes sense. If that's all they said, well, then you know maybe it's a stalemate. They argue their case, you argue yours. But once you say, but you do understand that the moment they walk out, the masks come off and they're drooling all over each other, right? Under those conditions, which, correct me if I'm wrong, was not the same as the beginning of the pandemic. In the beginning of the pandemic, there there was still more mingling after school than during, uh, but it was Zoom school, and I think that was actually closer to real social distancing, wasn't it? You know, a lot of the kids actually did not mingle with their friends for months. But I don't know anybody who's letting their kid not letting their kids mingle. Maybe I mean there might be somebody who's super afraid or has a might have a grandparent in the house or something. Yeah, I guess has exceptions. But wouldn't you say? But wouldn't you say that eighty percent are in full mingle mode after school, just for the best states? Anyway, I think that's your argument. That's your kill shot. Your kill shot is that the kids aren't doing it after school. So whatever sense it ever made doesn't make sense now. What did I just see go by? Um, there is a, uh, a new vaccine that just came out. Um, I don't know if you heard about this, but they're using a different technology this time. So the new vaccine is made entirely from the tears of masked uh, school children. Um, you, you probably didn't hear this story. But uh, the big question you're asking is, how do we get enough of that? You know, how are you going to get enough tears of masked school children? And uh, the experts assure us that there'll be no problem with the supply. No problem with the supply. So I'm, um, if you're not vaccinated yet, you might want to wait, because this is a more natural way to go than the mRNA platform. So the new vaccine made entirely from the tears of masked school children. Look for that. Uh, here's my mask rebel update from my town. Uh, yesterday, I had one uh, maskless encounter at a local coffee shop, and I was asked to put on my mask. Um, I did, because it was a small business at a local one. And I did it not because my state requires mandates, but because I only had to keep it on for mm, 60 seconds <laughs> while I ordered, and then I took it off. And basically, then they handed me a coffee, and then I took it off. <laughs> so, but to me, that was a courtesy to the employee. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. The courtesy is just to the employee. I don't have any fight with the employee. If they were asked to say that, they said that. You know, I generally don't bother working people in the same way that I was, I was talking about this the other day. If you see somebody who's a, a working driver, let's say the delivery truck or something, don't you usually give them the right away? I, I wonder if everybody does that. Like, if you have any kind of ambiguous situation, if they're a working person, even if you're in a hurry, don't you usually give... So he says, hell no. (laughs) Maybe you go the other way. I always think if you're working, I give you... you If you're on the job and I'm not, I always give you the right away, if it's ambiguous. All right. Um, What happened to wasting some of their time? That doesn't... uh, That's a good question. And uh, where I live, the mandates are going away in just a few days. So it, it's not really worth a fight to get something that's going to happen on its own if you just wait. But uh, in Safeway, I was the lone unmasked shopper. Lots and lots of people in Safeway. That's a local grocery store. And, but it's a big chain. And uh, not one person said anything. And I you know, paid. I interacted with the staff you know, the bagger, the, you know, everything. No problem. And yet I was literally the only unmasked person in the store. So I assume 
that the big corporations probably have told the employees don't push it. Do you think that's... Am I, do you think I'm making too much of an assumption? I think the small business doesn't want to take chances because, you know, they don't want to lawyer up. So I, I respect that. But the big companies, I think, have, you know, run it through all the simulations and said, you know, it's just better if we don't get in the business of enforcing. So if they're not enforcing shoplifting, and they're not... <laughs> the, the same company that doesn't enforce shoplifting, they're not going to chase you, they're not going to try to stop you, why would they challenge masks? And, and sure enough, they don't. I don't know if that's every store or just mine. Um, anyway, I was wondering if I had been challenged, if I said I had a medical exemption for the masks, what would happen? <laughs> Suppose somebody came up to you in a store and said, hey, we're still requiring masks. And you said, oh, yeah, I have a medical exemption. Would they ask for your papers? (laughs) I don't think they would know what to do, would they? Because I don't think anybody would say no if you said you had a medical exemption. (laughs) It's just one of those things people automatically defer to. You know, you're so... We're so uh, trained that if somebody has a medical exemption, you're like, oh, oh, okay. Like, you don't even argue that one, do you? It's like if a a high school girl is uh, missing some classes and says she has cramps, you're like, okay. (laughs) Like, that's the end of the questioning. (laughs) Medical exemption? Carry on, sir. So uh, I'm just curious whether that would work as easily as I think it would. Uh, I saw Thomas Massey, uh, Representative Massey, tweeting that uh, he quit flying planes in July because of the mandates. And he's been driving back and forth uh, to Congress uh, every session week for the past six months. That's a lot of driving. <laughs> the, this man is committed. So, I, But I appreciate his consistency. Uh, I have decided to join him in the most minor way, which is um, I'm also not going to fly until the mask mandates come off. Anybody else uh, want to join me? I think March 15th or something is when they're thinking of reconsidering that, if I'm right. Um, but I can wait till March. So I'm definitely not going to take a early March vacation <laughs> if I have to wear a mask on a plane, if I only have to wait two weeks and then I don't, you know. So I think a little, uh, a little creative economic pressure on the airline industry, they can handle it. It's just going to be a few weeks. I would just not book any flight within that time frame, unless it's work and you just have to. You know, if it's death in the family, you've got to do what you've got to do. But I think we could knock their, their revenue down 25% and get them to be more of an advocate for ending the mandates. Because they, they would try harder if their revenue were, were down sharply. Um, on other issues, there's a story about that the CIA may or may not be doing something that we may or may not dislike. And I think we should all be concerned about that. The details are that there was a secret program at the CIA that relied on a form of mass surveillance activity that involved the collection of an unknown data set. So we don't know what they were looking at because it was highly redacted information. Uh, But some senators looking into it, a couple of Democrat senators, good for them. Uh, And we don't know what they gathered or why they were doing it. So it's a very sketchy story, but all of it is bad. It's just all bad. (laughs) Whatever this is, it's all bad. All right, the CDC has changed the definition of a vaccine, which will make some people say, we told you all along that was no vaccine, and other people say, vaccines have never been 100%. And then you'll each claim victory, which I call word thinking. Everybody gets to define words the way they want to and then def- declare victory. But the CDC change, uh, I think, was reasonable under the circumstance. So uh, I, don't, I forget the details, but basically they're not saying that uh, it's going to prevent infection. So they, they got, I think they got rid of the prevent infection part and turned it into boosting your immune system. Now, some people say, ha-ha, gotcha. Vaccines always used to be about preventing infections. And so you lied to us when you said this was a vaccine. And if you have that point of view, how many of you have that point of view? How many of you have the point of view 
that calling it a vaccine was always a lie. Seeing quite a few yeses on locals, some no's. Yes, kind of, true. Right. Um, if you believed that it was a lie, that it was a vaccine, because they knew it wouldn't stop transmission, um, it, you know, the data shows it has an effect, but it doesn't stop it. So what, did, what was your opinion of the normal seasonal flu vaccine? For, for those of you who knew there was a thing called a, a regular flu shot, which was called a vaccine, now you knew that was only like 25% effective, right? Is that right? You knew that the regular seasonal flu shot is a vaccine, but it was only meant to be... It was only advertised as being like 25% effective because they can't really guess what the actual flu is going to be in time to make the vaccine. So it has always been true, and the most common part, literally probably one of the most common parts of our entire medical system is that people routinely get seasonal flu vaccinations that don't come anywhere near close to stopping transmission. They simply reduce it or might help a little bit. Right? So in my opinion, the definition of vaccine has for a long time been something that could help, but it's definitely not going to stop all transmission. But again, word thinking. Choose your own definition and you'll be happy. So uh, you may have seen a video of up in Canada, in at least one place, um, uh, there's some kind of a police officer type person goes to the door and they've been uh, looking at your uh, social media speech and if you said some stuff about the mandate they didn't like, they had some literature to hand out to you about uh, what a legal protest is, I guess. Now, imagine this happening in America. Th- this is one of those differences between Canada and America. And I don't think I'm wrong. But well, I'll see what you, th- you say. Right Now, this is not based on data, so I could be totally wrong. It's just an impression. My impression is, if somebody came to my door in America and said, we've been watching your social media language, and here's some literature from the government to maybe uh, change your mind about what you're saying on social media, what kind of a reception would such uh, officer of the law receive from me? (laughs) I think it would be unkind. Now, if they caught me by surprise, maybe I would just be too shocked to know how to respond. But once I learned it was a thing... Like if I'd heard it had happened to somebody else, by the time they got to my door, I'd be pretty prepared. <laughs> and I think that the verbal tirade that I would unleash on such a person would be sufficient to give them PTSD and maybe cause them to retire immediately. <laughs> but if I'm not good enough to do it, I think my neighbors could get it done. Do you think, do you think this would fly in America? I think we would be so viciously, uh, verbally uh, abusive to anybody who tried this. You knock on my frickin' door. I don't even want a telemarketer calling. But if you knock on my door and you disturb me at home, (laughs) do you you know that the first thing would be, I don't even care what your stupid flyer says. You knocked on my door for legal activity that I did at home on social media? I don't even care what, why you're there. You're already in trouble with me. <laughs> so, and the, by the time you hand me that uh, brochure, I'm pissed. I'm pissed. And if you don't think that Americans will say bad things to people in the law enforcement community, well, you haven't spent much time in America because we will say very bad things to law enforcement <laughs> at, at great personal risk. We will say anything to a law enforcement person, if we're mad enough. It's part of the American culture. Now, am, am I wrong that this wouldn't fly in America? Or, or am I just thinking we're awesome and, you know, it's just one of those things? I don't know. It just feels like it. So uh, keep an eye on that. Um, 
There's some new scary uh, news on uh, long COVID. So this would be people who get uh, COVID, and according to an article in Nature, which uh, I guess at this point I should put a disclaimer on anything about a study or data. And the disclaimer is everything we've seen so far seems sketchy (laughs) for like two years. It just seems like everything we see is like, I don't know. Maybe, but something sketchy about this. So I guess, you know, a uh, grain of salt on everything. But uh, the, what caught my attention <clears throat> is the degree, uh, I mean, how big a, an effect this is. So the study showed that uh, 30 days after infection for people who got COVID, now these are mostly unvaccinated people, I believe. If they got COVID... They had all manner of uh, heart diseases, like a whole bunch of them. And the percentage of difference is gigantic. It's like, you know, 40, 60% differences. Like gigantic differences compared to the baseline of somebody who never had COVID. Now, I don't know if any of that can be explained by any other variable that they didn't control for. That's what you always have to... You know, I don't know if the study was done with all the right parameters and scientific care. But... If this is true, so here, this is how many people die normally. So we'll forget about COVID. Uh, 659,000 people in America died from heart disease last year. That's the magnitude. What if that goes up by half <laughs> because of COVID? We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people with extra heart disease. And we're talking about a huge uh, risk from the virus itself, if it's true. Now, of course, you always have to worry if this is part of the scare campaign. (laughs) Yeah, I'm seeing the comments. Come on, Scott. So you have to wonder if, when you see data like this, is it part of a scare campaign to get you vaccinated, right? Is that that what you're thinking? So I don't think you necessarily have to believe the data. Now, some of you are saying, but what about the data that says that the vaccination itself will uh, increase your risk. Well, um, I think that applies only to a small percentage of people. And generally speaking, um, I think science... Let's just say that the, the consensus of science, which you might disagree with, but the consensus is very strongly on your heart risk from getting COVID is way higher, way higher, than your risk from the vaccine based on the data so far. But is the data correct? I don't know. Is any data correct? I don't know. But it's pretty scary. Um, Remember I told you long ago that if you want to predict the future, look what insurance companies are doing. Because insurance companies will price some behaviors out of existence. And and you'll be looking in the wrong direction. You'll say, what's the government say about this behavior? But it doesn't matter. If the insurance company is pricing it out of existence, it kind of doesn't matter what the law is. <laughs> so just look at the insurance companies to know what's going to happen in the future. And here's what insurance companies are doing. Um, apparently, they're going to charge more for your life insurance if you live in a county with a low vaccination rate. So insurance companies are already pricing vaccination into their model. Now, are the insurance companies good at looking at studies and estimating the odds of things? Well, I don't know. I've never worked at an insurance company, but I would guess they're really good at it. Would you? I mean, compared to other industries, who's going to be better at estimating risk than an insurance company, a big one, anyway? Now, that doesn't mean they get it right all the time, but uh, in terms of a profession, they're the ones who have to get it right. That's their whole business model. And their business model at the moment says that they would charge you more if you're unvaccinated. Again, that doesn't mean this is the final word, because all data is suspect in 2022. But in case you were wondering what the most qualified people are saying, In my opinion, the most qualified people would be the insurance companies because they have the greatest financial incentive. Uh, They would hire the most qualified people because they can't get it wrong, 
right? This is one of those things they just can't get wrong. They have to get this right. The rest of us might be involved in propaganda and confirmation bias and you know, God knows what. Maybe people are bought off. But the insurance companies just have to get it right. And they say getting vaccinated is way safer than not being vaccinated. That's not me saying it. I'm just passing it along. Now, here's the only uh, case I would like to make, that not everybody is equally credible. Am I right? Not everybody is equally credible. Who is credible? Is the, is the news industry credible? Not so much. Big Pharma? Mm, we wish. Not so much. Government? Not so much. Is your insurance company on your side? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. They're a big company. They're on their own side. But in this very narrow question, can you trust the free market to make insurance companies do at least the hardest amount of legitimate work with the best people to figure out what is true and what is not true? I think you could. Doesn't mean they're right. That's a different question. But who would be the most believable, most credible in the long run? In the long run. So, Bob, you're on a slightly different point than I am. I'm not saying you should trust any big company. Make sure you hear that part clearly or else you'll be confused. You shouldn't trust any big company, including insurance companies. I'm just saying that in that narrow question, they have to get the odds right. right? Now, I suppose they could uh, get the odds wrong and just overcharge, <laughs> but somebody's going to notice. And some other company will eventually you know, say, hey, I'll charge less because I can, and I'll undercut my competition. So in theory, market competition should get you the right answer. Market competition plus time plus insurance company's business model should get you the best answer. Anybody disagree? Uh, Who would you trust, let's say, over a few years, not on day one? In the fog of war, everybody's wrong. But over a few years... Who would be more likely to get it right than the insurance companies? Plus lawsuits. That, actually, that's a good comment. I, if, if I'm interpreting that right, you're saying that a lawsuit would probably do, be a good job of bringing in, you know, judged, adjudicated, literal, literally adjudicated information. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Anyway, just keep an eye on that. Doesn't mean they're right. It just means you should know about it. So did you see the viral video video of, uh, I guess he's an MMA fighter of some renown, named Israel uh, Adesanya? So I'd never heard of him, but maybe if you follow MMA, you would know. He looks looks pretty awesome. And uh, there was some MMA event he was at, and uh, a reporter asked about Joe Rogan and uh, Israel who began his comments, he jumped in and said, uh, I'm black, so I'll take this. <laughs> and then he just went on the most, awesome, uh, the most awesome defense of a Joe Rogan you've ever seen. I'm not even going to try to paraphrase it, because he did it so well. You just should see the original and not, not hear it ruined by me. But, but I'd like to point out that in his very first sentence, he used the C word... <laughs> The C word that got me demonetized on, on YouTube, uh, the one that I used against my, my critic online there. And so he, he just throws out the C word in the first part of the half of a sentence, and then he goes on. And that wasn't even, that wasn't even the good part. That was just the appetizer. <laughs> he uses the C word as just the appetizer, and then he gets to the main course. <laughs> anyway, go see it yourself. It's worth it. You can see it in my Twitter feed. Um, California schools are in crisis, uh, and uh, Oakland's going to close seven schools. So that's in my neighborhood. They're going to close seven schools. But it's a a variety of factors. So the charter schools are sucking up some students. Uh, People are leaving the state. The story, the news story said flattened immigration. But that must be a delayed effect from a carryover from the Trump administration, Right. Because it's not flattened at the moment, I don't think. But uh, it was flattened for a while, so I guess that affected school attendance. Uh, And lower birth rates. So the public schools are really hurting financially and otherwise. And the private schools, the charter schools, etc., 
are all going up. So in terms of direction, it's clear that things are going to get worse for anybody who stays in these public schools, and they're going to get a lot better in terms of the options, anyway, for people leaving. So keep an eye on that. Um, There is more fake news. How many of you saw some fake news? It's being called fake news, anyway. Uh, And because I have the most skeptical audience on the planet, I will tell you that we don't believe the fact-checkers automatically. Are you happy? So if I tell you something's been fact-checked, that doesn't mean I believe the fact-check, but I think you should hear it. Just, I think you should hear it, okay? And the, um, apparently there were a number of claims this week online that uh, there were excess deaths, if you look at the excess mortality rates, and that they were vaccine-related because the other causes were ruled out. Apparently that's fake news. And that the um, Scott Davison, the CEO of an insurance company, so here again, more insurance company wisdom, One America, um, he said that they saw a 40% rise in death rates among working-age individuals that it insures. So this is its own data, and again, I don't think they have the wrong data. They're just looking at their own customer base. They have good data on their own customer base, for sure. So if they saw a 40% rise in death rates um, in the working age groups in the third quarter, and he told them that, the, uh, that it's consistent with data from the CDC, but it's related to COVID deaths, um, both direct and indirect. So there are both direct COVID deaths and indirect. The indirect ones would be the lockdown, and how that affected people getting normal checkups and cancer checks and stuff like that. So, oh my God, that's a, that's a pretty big death rate. And certainly that argues against the, uh, against the lockdowns somewhat. All right. Um, I saw a tweet by Ian Miles Chiang, who is a good follow. You should follow him. He's got lots of good stuff. But I had to uh, take some exception with this. So the Biden administration has a new person overseeing the nuclear nuclear energy program in this country, I guess. And this is what Ian Miles Chung says, um, because there's a video of this individual uh, wearing a dress with a mustache and talking about um, identity, etc. And so this is uh, Ian Miles' tweet. He said, this person uh, identifies as genderqueer, with they, them pronouns. But then he goes on to misgender him by saying, (laughs) his kinks are animal sexuality and gay uncle BDSM, is now in charge of overseeing America's nuclear power plants. This is how empires end, not with a bang, but but whatever the hell this is. Um, Here's my counter to that. There's a thing I do on topics like this, as well as music and fashion and a number of other topics. I continually ask myself this question. What's this going to look like later? (laughs) You know, later on, later on, am I going to have a different view of this? In other words, you know, if you went through the uh, Jim Crow days, could you see then that later on this is going to look really bad, right? Like, was it obvious at the time? Could anybody say, well, you know, 20 years from now, we're going to really feel dumb that we did this? And I wonder if the way we uh, are treating members of the uh, um, LBQTQ, LBGTQ community, I'm wondering if the way that we treat them, we're just going to look back in 20 years and say, what the hell were we doing? You know, why, why, why did we even care about that? That was just their own business. So that's the first check. Um, and, and again, that's just a check. That's not an opinion. I'm just saying you should just say, what, what is this going to look like in 20 years? Whatever you come up with is your, your own opinion. And um, I would put the context on it like this. You're looking at an individual who has decided to be super transparent. You're comparing him. Um, I just misgendered. Let, let, let me say this, just so uh, I can be really clear. As you know, and much to the annoyance of my audience, I'm a big supporter of the LGBTQ community. Big fan. But 
I require one thing in return. One thing. That if I misgender somebody, you don't give me a hard time about it. Because there's no bad intention, right? That's all I ask in return, and I'm insistent on that. There, uh, there, I, won't take any, I won't take any pushback on that. My, that's my line. I, I will give you respect if you understand that there's a, a practical limit on people remembering to use the right words and blah, blah, blah. Just, just all I ask is don't be an asshole. Like, I'll, I'll do my best, but you do your best too. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. All right. So here's my take. If every leader were as transparent as the person in question here, we would be horrified. All of our leaders would look like horrible people if we knew all of their inner thoughts. If they never hid anything about themselves ever, you would hate everybody, right? There's a reason people are private. (laughs) It's because people would judge them. So I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm going to give uh, this individual a... I'm not going to ding this person for being transparent when all I'm asking for is for people to be transparent. If, I mean, for my benefit, right? Transparency is for my benefit. Would you rather that this person hid this preference and then uh, Russia found out about it? Huh? Ah? Uh, I just flipped a couple of you, didn't I? Didn't I? What's safer from uh, blackmail? Because, you know, you assume, you assume that our uh, opponents would like to blackmail anybody that they could to tell them to do whatever is bad for America. Hey, you stop making nuclear plants or whatever, in this case. So do you want somebody who has a secret life that they could be blackmailed for or somebody who is completely unblackmailable? That was sort of like Trump. What, what exactly were you going to find out about him that you didn't assume was true anyway? He, he was, you know, in a way, almost unblackmailable. So um, I think everybody's a freak when you uh, take the top layer off, um, and I think that I'd rather have transparency as long as the person can do a good job. So am I as, uh, let's say, uncomfortable with it as you are? Probably. <laughs> Probably. I, I'll be honest. When you see anything that's, um, let's say, just outside of your experience of what you're used to, it makes you uncomfortable, doesn't it? I can remember a time, and let me, let me confess this, because I think everybody should be able to confess this. There was a time I would have been uncomfortable around a gay man. I'm not now. Uh, yeah, at the moment, I, I'm not even sure it ever like trips my conscious, you know, my conscious wire. Uh, to, now it's just completely invisible. You live in California long enough, and whatever is routine in California becomes your reti- routine as well. But have, has any have any of you had that journey? Have you ever had the journey where you're like ah? This is outside my normal zone. I feel uncomfortable. And then later you're like, oh, okay, I'm, it's the same as everything else. Right? So do you believe there will never be a time that uh, seeing Harry Styles wear a dress will be anything? Uh, you know, in the case of entertainers, they're trying to, trying to be provocative. But I think there will be a time when... Um, People will be so transparent with this stuff specifically that you'll just stop caring about it. It just won't even, it won't even, won't be in your mind at all. It'll just disappear. So that's that's where uh, Ian Miles, Jung, and I may disagree on what this would look like 20 years from now. If you're judging it today, well, you know, I can see maybe how he got to that opinion, but I but I disagree with it. Uh, how would you like to see? Uh, a, le- a hypnotist diet plan. Um, I have just enough time to do this, okay? This is a plan for, for managing your diet, not losing weight, just managing your diet, that a hypnotist would use. Now, I'm not recommending this plan for you. I'm not a doctor. Check with your doctor. But it's an example 
of how a hypnotist would approach it, and it's an example of a system versus a goal. If you were just trying to lose weight the normal way, you might uh, just try to use your willpower. A hypnotist would never tell you to use your willpower because I don't think it exists. Here's how I would do it. I would break it into three parts. I would first say, let me solve my cravings because the cravings are the hard part. And I would say to myself, don't, wor- don't worry about quantity. Never let yourself be hungry. Phase one, never be hungry. Eat as much as you want, but only good food. Broccoli, all you want. Broccoli, broccoli, broccoli. Uh, lean meat, as much as you want. Forget about calories. This, in this phase, you're just trying to not eat chocolate, not eat um, sweets and stuff that will make you fat. That's all you're doing. There is no other objective of the first phase than to get rid of your cravings. Also, work on your sleep. How many of you knew that when you're sleepy, it feels like you're hungry and you can't eat enough? You're like, why, why does this food not make me not hungry anymore? I'm just eating. It's because you're sleepy. So to get rid of your cravings, eat good food as much as you want and do not worry, do not worry about um, quantity yet. Phase two, once you got rid of your cravings, move to foods, and this is, again, this is not doctor recommendation. You should all talk to your doctors before you go on a diet. This is just how I do it as an example of how you might create your own system. So use this as a, just as one of the things in your mental models that you can go to. <clears throat> I try to shrink my stomach. I'm not entirely sure there's any science to this. <laughs> Let me be clear. But it seems to me that if I go a few days without eating something of bulk, I feel as if physically my stomach has shrunk. I don't know if that's literally true, but it has the feeling. And so I eat things that are high in protein, but small in bulk, um, for a while. Once I feel that eating much becomes uncomfortable, then I go to the last one, which is reducing calories, making sh- make sure you have some kind of a fitness plan, and then make it easy to keep off the bad stuff. You have to make it easy for yourself. So don't keep any bad food in the house. If you have bad food in the house, you will eat the bad food. So don't. Just don't keep it in the house. And then learn by A-B testing over time how to make this healthier food more tasty. On day one of becoming a, a healthy eater, it's hell because you don't know how to make anything taste good. But once you learn that a uh, little lemon, a little soy sauce, a little salt and pepper uh, can make just about anything taste interesting, you're, you're all set. But you have to do that by A-B testing because your taste buds are different than everyone else's. So this system depends on using the mental part as your primary focus as opposed to willpower, which is actually an illusion. Nobody has willpower. Now, here are a couple other things a hypnotist would do. Some people say, don't look at the scales. Nope, look at the scales. Because that which is not measured is not managed. You should look at your scale every day. Yes, I get that muscle weighs, blah, blah, blah. blah. I don't care. Manage it by measuring it. If you don't measure it, your brain will not be committed. You need to see it, period. Anybody who gives you advice to not look at the scale is not thinking like a hypnotist, and I don't think that that's good advice. Number two, some of you say, I'll do, I'll do that diet, but I'll do a cheat day on the weekends. I get why you do it, because make, it makes you feel like you know, it's easier to sacrifice. I strongly disagree with that. The hypnotist would say, once you've developed a habit, let's say the habit of getting rid of your cravings, you don't want them back. Do not let them back in. I'll tell you, Halloween is a tough time at my house because it takes me two months to get off Snickers candy bars and there'll be this big barrel of them left over. You think I can resist them? I probably have more willpower, you know, the the fake kind because it doesn't really exist, but the ability to not do things that are harmful, I'm really high up on that self-control list. Like, you, you probably even could observe it, right? I'm always here for work. Don't weigh too much. Right. It's obvious that I have some kind of self-control, as we call it. 
Well, even I can't keep my hands out of these Snickers candy bars if there's a barrel of them sitting there. I just have to get them out of the house. That's the only thing I can do. So manage things like a hypnotist. Don't have cheat days because it sets you back. Always look at your uh, weight every day. Every single day you should weigh yourself. And then work on your cravings first to shrink your stomach second by low, low bulk foods. And then go back to your bulky foods if they're healthy, but uh, reduce your calories. It'll be easy by then if you build a system that makes it easy. That, ladies and gentlemen, is your micro lesson on diet. Now, within this system, you have lots of flexibility about what's in and what's out, right? And that's where your individual system comes into play. Some of you might say, you know, I don't really need this middle part. And that might be true. So A, B, test it. If you do it without the middle part and it works, keep doing that. The middle part, if you're just listening, is the shrinking the stomach part. So do what works for you, but use this as maybe a starting guide for something that would get you going. All right? How hard is it to eat as much as you want? Pretty easy. (laughs) Just eat as much as you want, and you'll be full, and that candy bar won't look as good as it did before you were full. That, ladies and gentlemen, is all I have for you today. Probably the most useful live stream of all time. That might actually be true, by the way. That might actually literally be true. Um, Because a lot of you are going to take this to heart and use it. I know that from history, because I've been promoting this uh, from my book, uh, How to Feel Almost Everything and Still Win Big, um, with a few tweaks. So I know that people are using it successfully. So some percentage of you just had your complete life changed around. And that's why you come here. Might not be you this time, but one of these days, I'm going to get you. And that's all we have. I'll see you tomorrow, YouTube.